next week. And the other is church. And in terms of prayers, I uh, hope some of you were able to watch Gene Gresham's funeral yesterday online. If not, it's still online. Uh, Jim went down and uh, represented the church. And we thank you for doing that, Jim, and all the right. Uh, Nicole DeMarco was added to our prayer list. Anyone else? Hearing none, we're going to stand. Oh, wait, I'm going to go ahead and do a scripture reading first. Let's do that first. My scripture reading this morning comes from 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has done or does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Let's go ahead and stand. Keith will have our opening prayer, and then we'll sing to the Lord. Thank you, Father, for this day. We uh, pray, Father, for your blessing upon our time together. We ask, Father, that uh, we would be enriched, and most of all, that we uh, indeed would be encouraged and challenged to uh, to prepare to live our lives uh, more fully as we should for you. Again, we thank you, we praise you, and above all, uh, we give glory to you through Jesus our Lord. Amen.
sometimes uh, in our worship gathering is like meeting a hearse in traffic. It calls to move out of the busyness and pause and reflect. Take time, take your mind off of the traffic and light and consider the unspoken messages of that reminded of Jesus' death. Paul gave us something to think about and while we pause. For whenever we eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. While you eat the bread and drink from the cup, pause and contemplate what Jesus' sacrificial death means for your life. Not only during rush hour, but also for eternity. Remember the hope and the pre uh, remember the hope and peace that his resurrection brings to your life. This pause will help keep a bright attitude as you merge back into the traffic of our day. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we take this bread and drink this cup, help us to recall the price that was paid so we can share this meal. Father, please bring to our recollection the full meaning of this communion. Help us to truly recommit to live and to die as Jesus did. Amen. Good morning, everyone. so much for uh, who you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the privilege of being able to be your children. God, we pray that you please would lead us, Lord God, with your Holy Spirit. Uh, strengthen us, God, in your word. Help us, God, to live for you and do what's right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you guys would please take and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We actually were there last week. We talked about the parable of the sower last week. Uh, to the bringing in the sheaves to the both last week and this week. Uh, but Matthew chapter 13, this we're going to be looking at starting with verse 24. So 24 through 30, and then 36 through 43 we'll be looking at later. And in your bulletins, if you would, you can uh, follow along in the sermon outline. We are continuing our series uh, in the parables of Jesus. Uh, so we did the parable of the sower last week. This week we'll be looking at the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the parable of the weeds. Uh, depending on which translation you have. Now, many of you guys, some of y'all may know what this is. <clears throat> some of you may not. But this is what they call a sickle. Okay? And so back in the day, they would use this to cut down the wheat, okay? And uh, and, and, and separate the wheat, later they would separate the wheat um, from the tares. But uh, one day, the uh, Lord's angels are going to actually be using something similar, I believe, because they're going to be bringing in the weeds and separating the weeds. Uh, we'll be reading about that here in just a little bit. But uh, Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 24. Jesus told them another parable. Now, what is a parable? We talked about last week. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. 
But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in the field? Where did these weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you're pulling the weeds, you may also root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles, and they will be burnt, to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring them in to the barn. Brothers and sisters, this is exactly what has happened in the United States of America. We know from other parables that the true good seed is the Word of God. Originally, it was planted in both homes and in churches and in the schools. The founders knew how important it was to plant the Word of God in people's hearts. In fact, they absolutely insisted upon people learning the Word of God, and they guarded that. We must get back to, we must get back to that, returning truth, restor restoring the preaching and teaching of the Word of God for the church's sake and also for the nation's sake. And I say churches in the broad term. For about 330 years, uh, for about 330 years going back to Plymouth Rock, generation after gener generation clearly and closely guarded what the, what the children were taught. But in the 1960s, and specifically 62 and 63, that all changed. While people were spiritually sleeping, false teaching began to be planted first in the schools and then in the churches. We are now living the parable of the wheat and the weeds right now in the midst of our country. Right here in our midst. Now, Jesus is, uh, Jesus is going to give us the explanation. Let's, let's pick up with that here in just a minute. But now, now, I want to say this here first. How can almost, how can almost all the denominations at this point be taking an unbiblical view of marriage and an unbiblical view of the sanctity of human life? And yet that's what's happening in most of the country at this point. That's happening all over the place. Now how can that be happening? They've abandoned the truth of the word of God. Jesus is going to uh, give us the explanation of this parable. Uh, verse 36. Then he left the crowd and he went into the house. Uh, his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The, the, excuse me, the field is the world. The field is the world. The good seed stands for the kingdom of God. Now, remember, we're to be a part of the kingdom of God. We must first receive the good seed, the word of God, in our hearts and uh, obey. We need to uh, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live a faithful life. That's the plan of salvation. Uh, the, the weeds are, this, are those of the evil one. Those are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy that sows that is the devil himself. The harvest is the end of the age. The harvest serves are his angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. Those who are the sons of the evil will be burned in the fire at the end of the age. Then the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And so I say this in love. I hope and pray none of us are causing anyone to sin and that none of us are actively participating in evil. Because according to this passage, we will suffer for that. They will be thrown into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has, he who has ears, let him hear. We talked about that last week as far as when uh, it says, He who has ears, let him hear. He's saying, hey, pay attention, this is really, really, really important. We must first ask, we must first ask ourselves, we must first ask ourselves some questions about the purposes of this parable, the, the different purposes of the parable. The first one is this, to show that in this world, in this world, both good and bad grow together. In this world, both good and bad grow together. God is the author of all that is good, Yahweh, okay, our Heavenly Father, okay, and Satan is the author of all that is bad or evil. It, it is not God's will for us to uproot the weeds. Now what I mean by that, I mean the people. It's not God's will for us to uproot the weeds. Okay? If they can't be converted, the angels will uproot them at the end of the world. However, however, we are, 
uh, to abolish every argument that presents itself as knowledge against the Word of God. Okay? So we are to uh, fight against false teaching and refute evil teaching. Okay? False teaching. Okay? So, the, uh, now, so that's, so we don't know who the people, but we do fight against false teaching. You do that just by loving God, loving people, and proclaiming the truth of God's Word. Now, the one field, the field is the world. This is God's world. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all that live in it. Psalms 24, verse 1 says, For every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. All right, guys, every time, there's some beautiful places to ride around here, but every time I see cattle, that's the first thing that comes to mind to me. That, that verse. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to me. Okay, they, they belong to the Lord. That's, the, that's that passage. Psalms 50, verse 10. Okay, they all belong to the Lord. The, the two sowers. He that sows the good is the son of man. That's Matthew 13, 37. Every good and perfect gift is from above. James 1, 17. His word is called seed, and it is good. Luke 8, 11. God himself is absolutely good. We know that. Matthew 19, 17. There's nothing uh, bad or evil at all in God. He is holy. He's pure. The enemy that sowed the weeds or the tares is the devil himself. In Matthew 13, 39. God's enemy and man's enemy, our enemy also. Peter actually calls him our adversary. Now, what does that mean? He is our opponent. Okay? He is our accuser. That's uh, 1 Peter 5, 8. Now, why did Satan sow the weeds or tares? Why did he sow the bad seed? Because he is an enemy of God. Remember, he wanted to be like God himself. And what happened is he wanted to be like God himself. And he's full of pride. He's full of arrogance. Okay? He was cast out of heaven, along with, from what I read, at least a third of the angels were cast down with him. Okay? So, uh, but why does Satan sow the weeds of bad seed? Because he's the enemy of God, he's also the enemy of mankind. Out of spite to ruin a good crop, such things have been going on uh, from one man treating another, man, another person that way as well. My grandfather, he gives this illustration, he gives this illustration, he says, My grandfather knew a man who was so angry with his girlfriend's father. Now get this. Okay? He's so mad with his girlfriend's father that he sowed Johnson grass in his field. Now that's a creative but mean thing to do, right? Okay. He later married the girl and then inherited the farm. <laughs> <laughs> and he spent the rest of his life fighting against the weeds that he himself had planted. Isn't that something? Okay. Um, it, okay. In, in, this, in this passage, how did he... How did he, being Satan, manage to sow the pestilent weeds without being detected sooner? How did that happen? He did it while men slept. Now, I'm not talking about physically sleeping, but brothers and sisters, it says we need to pray and we need to be alert. Okay? We need to pray and we need to be, what is it referring to? We need to be spiritually alert. And for so long, I, many, I'm not saying I'm not saying specific people, but for so long in our country, people have spiritually fallen asleep because they've drifted from the Word of God. When you get back in the Word, you realize, wait a minute, hey, okay, this is what the Scriptures say. This is what's happening over here. That doesn't fit, okay, right? This is what the Scriptures say. This doesn't fit over here either. But because we get out of the Word, and we don't stay in the Word, we don't have a living in our hearts as much as we should, then these things can get, they get away with stuff over here, and it ends up tearing things down over time. This is one of the main reasons why preachers and elders should be vigilant to keep in close contact, keep, keep in close uh, touch with members of the congregation uh, and make sure that we spiritually stay focused but also spiritually protect those that are under our care. Uh, can I be blunt? This is happening right now in the majority of the churches today. It's happening in the majority of the churches today. It, abandoning the scriptures and following, honestly, in many cases, the teachings of a guy named Karl Marx. Yeah, that's what's happening. That's what's happening in many of the churches today. But not only that, not only that, uh, here's some others. The theory of evolution, right? Okay? The theory of evolution is now being presented as something that's fact. It's not fact. There's no evidence of a missing link. Every time they find a missing, or every time they find a skull and say, oh, we found a missing link, we found it, or they find a, you know, a tooth or whatever, it ends up being a pig's tooth or a gorilla skull. It doesn't fit, right? They always found a missing link. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. When you really study it, there is no missing link. But yet, evolution is being taught as fact in many of our schools and many of our colleges. Now, think about this for a minute. If you, if you believe that you just descended, I mean, just happened to the Big Bang and all that, you just, you 
know, just, just evolved over time, what does that take out of the picture? God himself, doesn't it? It takes God out of the picture. But that's what we know from the scriptures. God created the world. Well, it could have been, the days could have changed. And that, <laughs> if it says a day, it's a day. God created a day, right? He created, you know, the sun comes up, the sun goes down, right? Okay, the, the, okay the, technically the earth is turning, okay? Uh, why change the time frame? The scriptures won't change the time frame, okay? So evolution is being taught as a fact, but it's not a fact. But it takes God out of the picture. Now, if you think about it, if you don't believe that you came from God and God created you, what's that do to your value of life? What's that do to your purpose in life? What does that do as far as your, uh, how you're going to live your life, right? You've got nothing to stand on when you believe the evolution to be real, okay? Um, now, but it's not just that. Infant baptism, for example. There's no place in the scriptures that it says to baptize an infant. It's not in there. And yet it's in many of the denominations today. Once saved, always saved. I believe, so I'm good. That's all i got to do. That's, I'm good for the rest of my life. Is that consistent with the scriptures? No. No, it's not. We're called to be faithful. We're called to be obedient. You look at the parable of the talents. The ones that did something with what they were given were the ones that were rewarded. The ones that did nothing were the ones that were rebuked, rebuked and cast out. Uh, just believing and being saved. It is more than just believing. Um, the unbiblical concept of asking Jesus into your heart. Right? Oh, we hear that all the time. We hear it everywhere. Oh, just ask Jesus. It's not in the scriptures. That's not there. Okay? Now, it does mention Jesus knocking at the door of someone's heart, but it's not for salvation. It's mentioned in Revelation. But when you talk about somebody becoming a Christian, there's, there's a process that the scriptures share, and it never mentions just asking Jesus into your heart. That whole concept didn't come about to the last uh, 150 years, or maybe the last 100 years, is really when that took root in our country. Um, none of these things are found in the scriptures, and yet they dominate people's thoughts today. They dominate commentaries. When you go to study the scriptures, you go to pick up this commentary on this topic, or commentary on this topic, these things are seeped into those commentaries. And if you don't know the word of God, you're going to fall for it. Okay? You've got, you got to study the scriptures. Now, Okay, so uh, they dominate people's thoughts and minds today, and it's a completely unbiblical view. Now, Jesus said, if we build our lives on him, okay, it's like we're building our lives on a strong foundation, right? So when the storms of life come, when all those storms come, and they will, when the storms of life come, by standing on Jesus and him being our solid foundation, we'll make it through that storm. But if you build on any other foundation, right, it's like building on sand. And when those storms come, you'll have nothing in your, your house, your spiritual house will collapse. <clears throat> it's sad, it's pathetic that that's what's happening because we're abandoning truth. You know, in Josiah's day, and this is not in my notes, this is just stuff God gave to me. In Josiah's day, what was the problem? They took the scriptures and they began to hide them. They're in the temple, but they put them underneath stuff, right? Okay, and they began to ignore the word of God. And all this time, the judgment of God was progressing towards them. Why? Because they neglected God and did not obey him. And when they went back and they found the scriptures, Josiah heard what was in the scriptures for the first time. He repented and he called everybody else to repentance before God. And they got back on track and there was revival. Okay, we must know the difference between defending the faith and defending too. So, Okay, now here's, uh, we're going to look at two, the two crops. Let's get, look at the two crops. What were the tares is the first one, the weeds, okay? The weeds. These are the children of the wicked one, according to Matthew 13, 38. Weeds have no value to a farmer, do they? No. Uh, they, dam they, they, damage the, they damage the crop, don't they? Okay, they do. They reduce the amount of crop that you will receive, right? You've ever been out there, you've been a gardener? All right, you want to get rid of weeds because it will fight against the very crops that you have. That makes sense, right? So you want to continue to... That's why uh, gardening with raised beds is good. You don't have to fight the weeds as much for you. Give it a shot. It works much better. Anyway, so just a thought. But anyway, uh, you have to weed in order to keep, to keep the weeds out so that the plants can continue to grow. Um, they reduce the crop of weed, making the field less profitable. Some tares are even poisonous, and they also corrupt. Do not be deceived, Scripture says. Bad company corrupts good morals. Come to your senses and stop sinning. Stop sinning. 
For some people are ignorant about God, and I say this to your shame. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 33 and 34. Evil corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. Be careful that the friends that you choose. Now, we need to witness to some. Yes, that's true. No question about it. Okay? But we need to have brothers and sisters in Christ that love us and will tell us, look, man, I love you, but you're wrong. <laughs> right? We need friends like that. That's a true friend. Preferably they do that one-on-one. -on -one, okay? All right? That's the best setting to do that. Okay? But you need brothers and sisters in Christ that will do that for you. That's a true friend who loves God first and who loves you second. And I, this is years ago, but, uh, Years ago, I was, I, was, I was doing something I shouldn't have been doing. I had a friend of mine. He talked to me. He said, he said Chris, let me tell you something. He said, I love you. You know that. He said, uh, but I love Jesus more. And what you're doing is wrong. And uh, he said, you, you need to get back on track with God. And that very statement, that very statement of I love you, but I love God more, boom. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that hit me like a ton of bricks. And it shook me right out. I was like, that, that brought me back on track. Okay? We need friends like that to say, look, I love you, but what you're doing is wrong, and it's leading you down the wrong path. Okay? And that, where, that destination's not good. Okay? You need know, to get back on the right path with God. So, uh, the wheat. Let's look at the wheat. The wheat are the children of the kingdom of God. The wheat are the kingdom of the children of God. God has sown nothing but good seed in the world. Adam and Eve, remember after creating man, he says it was good after everything, but after he created man, at the very end, he says it was very good, right? In the natural, wheat is often overcome by the tares and the weeds, right? That makes sense, okay? If you have a field, you've got weeds out there, uh, there are, honestly, the weed a lot of times is going to be overcome by that. But God gives his people special help to overcome the world. In the natural, weeds are always weeds, but in the spiritual, get this, in the spiritual, Sometimes weeds become wheat. What? Wait a minute. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Sometimes weeds become weeds become wheat. Now, years ago, there was a girl in our youth ministry who honestly she was a sarcastic little thing. <laughs> wow, was she sarcastic? Obnoxious. I mean, just uh, you know, smart alecky. You know, just a, you know, sixth grade girl. Just at the time, it seemed like she was really full of herself. You know, just I mean, just one of the tough personality to deal with. But she came from a terrible home situation. She came from a terrible home situation. And her parents were always fighting. Always fighting. I mean, I mean, I just remember like we would get calls to try to go and help, and her parents were just always fighting. Her brothers were as wild as they could be, and uh, they were in all kinds of sin and trouble. So God gave both my heart and my mind the perspective of where she was coming from every time I dealt with her. And it changed my it changed my perspective, it changed my, you know, and how I dealt with her. So what I realized was is that most of the stuff she was doing was really a cry for help. And that's what it was. And honestly, if you see kids like that, there's usually a reason. Um, that's a side note, but that's really true. If, they, if they're acting out, there usually is a reason that they're acting out. Okay? Sometimes it's just a complete lack of discipline, but in, in most cases, it's because something's happening. I went to one of our God honor mamas uh, who had uh, a couple spiritually focused girls herself. And I asked her, I said, Will you please take the other girl under your wing? And she did. And I asked another lady who was like a grandmother type to take the whole group of girls and to do a discipleship group with them and to meet with them on a weekly basis throughout the school year, and she did as well. Praise the Lord. She grew in Christ. She grew in character. She went on and went to Bible college, and guess what? She is married to a missionary and serving along in a foreign land with Pioneer Bible Translators as we speak. Because of who God is, and because of God's power, because of the truth of the Word of God, and she's not that smart of a little girl anymore. <laughs> she's not that. Uh, she's a humble, strong in the faith, gentle uh, woman of God doing a great work for the kingdom of God. And praise God to God be all the glory. All of it. God can work through you to do the same. To change weeds to wheat, if you're willing, to let God love you 
we do. Uh, I share that because uh, sometimes God changes weeds to weeds, spiritually speaking. The Corinthians, honestly, they were a really sorry lot of people. They were. The Corinthians were a sorry lot, okay? Uh, the Apostle Paul writes to them. He says, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Listen, that's who you used to be. And I think there's well intentioned to say, oh, I'm just a sinner. I think that's well intentioned. I think that's the intent of it. You hear it often. But that's not who you are. That's who you were. Okay? We'll do a sermon on this at some point. When you come to Christ, you're not just, oh, I'm just a sinner anymore. You are a child of the King. You are a child of God. You are a new creation. You are a, you are a you're Christ ambassador. Okay? You've been washed to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Your, your very identity spiritually has been transformed. James 1, 18 says, of, it, uh, um, of his own will be uh, brought forth by oh, uh, brought forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of all uh, creation. Since, you've been, uh, since you have an obedience to the truth, been purified, you purified your souls through a sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart. For you've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but seed that is imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we had done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we will be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then John 3, 3, uh, 3 and 5 says, We are born again, both of the water and of the Spirit. Born both of the water and of the Spirit. Now we must ask several questions regarding this topic. The servants ask, do you want us to go and pull them up? Now to be clear, uh, to be clear here, this is implying extermination of the weeds. The answer from the owner of the field is immediately no, no. It was difficult, if not impossible, to root up weeds without destroying the wheat. Christians are intertwined now and will be separated at the harvest. Sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between the two. Some of the more promising Christians turn out to be very disappointing. Right? It's sad, but it's true. Okay? I mean, honestly, I can think back to Bible college. I can think of guys, they had all kinds of talents and all kinds of abilities, but they shipwrecked their faith because of, they didn't keep their spiritual armor on. They didn't stay focused. Uh, some, some wild, crude, trying, uh, trying to live on your last nerve, young Christians. Okay, and honestly, sometimes some people they have that personality to steal on your nerves, and it's just gonna, they're stomping on your last nerve. <laughs> yeah, you ever been through that? Okay, you love them anyway. You love them because God can take and transform that young person into someone that will make a tremendous difference for Jesus Christ. Think about it. Um, John Mark. John Mark. What happened with him? Okay, there was such a uh, Disagreement that they split company for a while. But later on, Paul's like, hey, bring Mark with you, right? Things have been restored. Things were good, okay? Peter, man, Peter, went, you know, I mean, he went from, you know, all the different things that he went through and then became one of the pillars of the church. Thomas, down in Thomas, okay, came to faith in Christ. So, sometimes when we help a wayward boy, we just might and very likely are helping a future elder or potential evangelist or deacon or somebody that's going to serve in the Lord's church in some capacity down the road. So love them anyway, okay? We aren't qualified to pull up the weeds. That job will be done by the angels. Now the two harvests, the weeds, if not changed and converted, will be burned up in the fire. That's uh, verse 30 and verse 40. You know, for, verse 42 says a furnace. Okay? But, but gather the wheat into the barn. Then shall the righteous shine like the sun. Then shall the righteous shine like the sun. He who has ears, let him hear. In other words, did you get that? Are you listening? This is extremely important. There are more. There, there are some other questions that must be dealt with uh, when we go through this. We live in extraordinary times. We are never to go and use physical force to try to force people to become Christians. Okay? Other religions do that. We're not to do that. Islam attempts to do that. To use physical force to try to convert them to Islam. We as Christians are not to do that. God gives, us, God gives us freedom to choose, okay, uh, to follow him. He doesn't force us. We can plead, we can encourage, we can challenge, we can love, 
but we never use physical force to try to convert people. God gives us the freedom to choose and shows us, uh, shows us how to use love and kindness and the word of God to do so. Now some other questions. Is it okay with God and biblical to use self-defense to protect our family? Now you think, well, what does that have to do with this? Well, it does, actually, if you think about it on a really, really, really deep level. Okay? Absolutely, yes, it's biblical for you to be able to protect your family. Okay? Yes. Uh, is it okay with God and biblical for us to stand for what's right, to stand with, uh, stand with the authorities and support the government and law enforcement? Absolutely. God tells us through Romans that that is the case. And so if you have, if you have worked for the government in a position of authority and you had to deal with those that were breaking the law or they were, they were going against God, okay, um, then it, it says they, bear the, they do not bear the sword for nothing. They do not bear the sword for nothing. Okay? So in that case, it's okay. If you have to, uh, you've tried every step to be able to uh, use force. Yes, that is biblical. Uh, we don't go and seek a fight. But it is absolutely necessary. It, but if it's absolutely necessary and it's good and right and it's a noble cause, then we are caused. They are we are called to stand and to fight for what's good, for what's noble, what's right. If a battle or war is brought upon us. So looking at through the scriptures, as I see it, the only time that we lay down our life, and uh, this is for us individually, okay? The only time that we lay down our life, the way I see it from the scriptures, is if somebody holds a gun to your head and they say, "Are you a Christian?" And you, at that point, you take a stand for Jesus. Your witness is what matters. You remember Jesus said, you take a stand for me, I will take a stand for you. But it's okay for you, if somebody breaks into your house and is trying to hurt you or your family, it's okay for you to protect yourself and protect your family. Okay, so that's, there is a difference, there's a major difference there. Um, this raises another question. So how, how do we fight the battle now? We fight the battle spiritually first, through repentance of sin, through prayer, through putting on the armor of God, through the name of Jesus, through the truth of the Word of God, through teaching and preaching the Word of God, through biblical education, through standing up and getting engaged in discussions, through living a God-honoring life, through being strong and courageous, and through God's strength, um, and through also opposing false teaching that is so rampant in the society today. Teach the truth, preach the Word. With God's help, uh, people will get a more solid foundation over time and build their lives on Jesus. Make no mistake, though, we are spiritually at war. And sometimes the spiritual goes into the physical. We, we, fight, we fight spiritually first and always we must be prepared for whatever comes our way. God will show us what to do at the right time. Build your life on Jesus Christ and upon his pure word. Be the wheat that is mentioned, that is the children of God, and do the best that you possibly can to convert as many weeds to wheat as you possibly can in the time that you were given. This morning, if you have a decision to make for Jesus Christ, you say, you know what, I've never made that decision to become a child of God, then why not today? Why not today? <clears throat> if you have a decision to make, please come forward as we sing our closing hymn.
thank you all very much for being here today. I just want to encourage you in this. Um, love God and love people. Yes, okay, that's for everyone. But also for those that have nothing that they can return to you. Okay? Um, some of you guys have neighbors that are completely lost. They don't know Christ at all. Can I encourage you to love them? I mean, if they need help, I mean, uh, you know, with a, with a garden or with carrying groceries in or any little act of kindness, those kinds of things build a bridge over time, build a relationship over time that then gives you uh, the opportunity to invite them to church uh, and also help, help them to come to know Christ as Lord as well. And so um, just think and pray about that. Look for opportunities because there's tons of opportunities out there. And uh, so uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Jim if he would uh, pray for us. Father, then we thank you for the opportunity to gather in this place to study your word and sing praises to your name and to what's around the table. Help us, Father, to reach out to those around us. May we be a light into the world as you've asked us to be. May we search out those who are lost and those who are in need. Help us, Father, to help those that are less uh, fortunate than we are. We ask that you give each of us guide and direct us. May we do the things you have us to do. We thank you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God loves you. We love you. Have a great week. <clears throat>